So I'm going to talk about the Grundig um, dispute, which was an industrial strike, which is famous now, remembered for um, the role of South Asian women. Um, quickly about what happened there. So it was a photo processing plant in uh, North London. And over a period of few years, the, the workers in that plant changed from um, predominantly white, but there were some uh, Caribbean workers and Irish workers to um, a majority of South Asian workers in particular sections of the factory. So for example, the drivers and loaders were um, uh, black British, but um, the workers in the finance department was predominantly South Asian. And this happened, and this happens again and again, because there was a new generation of migrants coming from East um, Africa, South Asian um, women, uh, South Asian families, and they were looking for work because they had been from middle class backgrounds and they found themselves um, at the um, following migration. There's a whole class dislocation they experienced and they needed to get uh, to work, even if they hadn't engaged in paid work before. And the local employers saw them as the ideal workforce because they were constructed as docile, as hardworking. So these stereotypes that play up again and again with each recent group of migrants who are seen as ideal workers at the same time as they're also seen as scroungers. So that's another story. Um, and so gradually the workforce changed entirely and leaflets were handed out to encourage South Asian women to come and join there and to discourage and white workers who'd come to work there were discouraged because they were told, oh, you won't be able to manage, you know, with the wages we give here. But beyond that, and in that song, there was a reference to low wages. Low, wages were low there, but it was not just the wages that were low. The conditions at work were, were particularly exploitative, uh, they were particularly oppressive, and it was a combination of gender as well as race that created that set of conditions. So South Asian women workers were um, expected to work overtime at very short uh, notice, and we all know that women have to go home and do a second shift after work. And, and this was particularly uh, arduous for them at seven o'clock in the evening to be told that you had to stay back. There was also a high level of disrespect. And this again played on both gender and race. The white managers, for instance, would um, uh, require the Asian women to raise their hands if they needed to go to the toilet. Um, the amount, you know, if they went more than a certain number of times, they would be uh, questioned about it. So this played on, um, Gen, certain gender constructs and ideas of shame uh, in, related to, uh, in relation to going to the toilet, which somehow seems to apply only to women, not to men. So Donald Trump, for example, finds it disgusting that women pee, but it's okay for men to do that. Um, and so there's this whole, there's a gendered construction of shame on women's bodily functions. And so they played on that. Um, and again, the whole management structure was such that it was white managers and a South Asian women workers. So both race and gender combined to create the oppressive conditions there. Um, one day, a particular set of uh, um, you know, events took place. Some of the workers there were students, and, and they were there in the summer when the demand for uh, holiday photographs was at its peak. So that morning, there had been a little bit of an altercation at, at the workplace. And uh, one of the workers, her son, had, was working there in the summer, and he was laughing with his friends on the uh, you know, production line, as you might do if you're students. So the manager turned to them and said, stop chattering like monkeys. This is not a zoo. And we all know what monkeys means, despite um, Millwall supporters claiming they don't know what that phrase means in the context of race. It's evident to all of us. So Jabin Desai was very upset at this reference that had been made to her son. Now, later that day, as she was leaving for work, um, she'd finished work, she was told that she'd have to stay back that night for an overtime. And uh, she was mindful that it was a long journey home, that she had to cook when she got home. She refused to do that. The so angry words were exchanged with her manager. And they, all, they had the system where there was this glass uh, cabin and the manager would call you there and reprimand you so everyone else could see it. So, and this whole sense of shame that they played on and hierarchies. Um, she turned to the manager and said, um, let me tell you something, Mr. Manager. What you run here is not a factory, it is a zoo. And in a zoo, you have many different kinds of animals. You have monkeys who dance to your tune. You also have lions who can bite you back. And she said, we are the lions, Mr. Manager. I've had enough. And she walked out. And as she walked out, she told the other workers, he wouldn't treat white workers the way he treats us. And so it was clear that there was an element of race there right from the beginning. Um, 
And uh, after she walked out, the other workers, um, it was a weekend, they stood outside the factory gate. And then the next day, they went and uh, found out uh, about trade unions. They joined a trade union, put up a list of demands. For a few months, it was very quiet. There was not much support. There were lonely, you know, just a few women workers, South Asian women on the picket. Gradually, um, <clears throat> the trade union came around, supported them, and the TUC took their cause on. And these workers went around to other factories, other uh, workplaces across the country to talk about their cause. Now, this is a context in which previously uh, trade unions in the UK had a terrible history of not supporting uh, black workers, of women workers. So work, migrants, women workers, for example, found that any struggle for their rights, they had to pit themselves against not just the employer, but also the trade union and their fellow workers. But I think part of the reason why this succeeded, apart from the time itself, you know, there's a particular um, time in history, uh, was also because um, they managed to construct this as the, uh, the struggle of the, of the poor Asian women workers for union recognition. So they're not being allowed to recognize the trade union, so we need to defend their right to join our union. Uh, I think that was part of the success story. But eventually, a few months afterwards, they gained a lot of support from the trade union and on the streets of North London, we saw, you know, demonstrations where 20,000 people turned up. So huge, it, it dominated the headlines for a long, uh, for a period of a few weeks. There was a high level of police violence there. And in fact, the special patrol group tested their technique, violent techniques on them before they moved on to the minor strike later. But what happened after that, after a few uh, weeks and months of picketing, was the Labour government was in a very strong, uh, very, very small mi uh, majority and they put pressure on the trade union to withdraw their support. So we know that now because uh, I've seen the cabinet papers which were released uh, following the 30-year rule um, and the trade union congress withdrew their support for the workers. And what beh behind this, what happened was um, the dispute was referred to an arbitration committee and then to a Scarman report, a government report, um, and that report recommended, found in favor of the workers, but the owner of the factory refused to accept it. So, a lot of detail, but what you need to remember is, there was an attempt to move the dispute, move the fight from the street, and from a fight about solidarity of workers to a bureaucratic process, which, um, which relied on, um, you know, very small measures, which relied on recommendations, which relied on cooperation. And, and the workers were against that, but they were overruled by the trade union. It ended with the workers going on hunger strike outside the trade union congress building. Um, so in many ways, um, it wasn't a story of a success. This was a strike that ended in defeat. But we remember it today as a, as a very important moment in British labor history. And I think it's, um, we do that for two reasons, I think, primarily. I think the first is that, um, this strike happened at a very important moment in history. And just 10 years back, Enoch Powell made his reverse of blood speech. And when he made that speech, the Dock Workers Union marched to the parliament with their banner, demanding an end to immigration. And just 10 years after that, during the Grunwick strike, the same union had their banner and they came in support of these workers. So I feel that's something really important to remember because we've had our, the Brexit referendum where migrant workers were pitted against resident workers and we had this narrative and the country voted very by a small margin but to leave so it seems like a moment when you know the working class is so divided but we've been there before and then Grunwick did happen unfortunately that sentiment i think didn't prevail but it's an important you know moment to remember that the tide can change and the working class can see a common sense of purpose in history um, um, the second reason why I think it's really important to remember this is also because a lot of our understanding of history and our understanding of um, struggle, of struggle for workers' rights in this case, seems to exclude the struggles and voices and the, um, of migrant workers, of women workers. And for South Asian women, for example, we still have a stereotype of the South Asian women as passive, as um, confined to the domestic sphere, we don't really see them as workers, as and definitely not as workers who have um, gained us the rights that we enjoy today, and who have transformed the trade union through their struggles. So what Grunwick did do was it led to a 
the beginning of a process which still is ongoing and has a long way to go of acknowledging the needs of migrant and women workers, of the trade unions being more responsive um, and representative of, of migrant and women workers. So that's again um, a reason why we need to remember Grunvig. And I'm just checking the time. I think I've finished, I've, I've gone beyond my time. So when, when we finish this research, you know, as academics, we do books and we do, you know, there's the Striking Women book that was mentioned, but we felt that wasn't enough. We needed to take the story beyond academic communities. And so we created, made up yeah, the website, which is here. It's a website aimed at school children and, and tells the story in terms of there's four modules which align to the curriculum, national curriculum migration. Then there's a history of women and work. Um, and the third one is called rights and responsibilities, but it's really about rights. But we had to call it that because that's what the curriculum calls it. And the last is about the um, struggle at Grunwick and Gabe Gomez, which is the other dispute. And this is the comic. We created a comic for children. Again, because we need to tell these stories to our ch uh, children, we need to, in particularly in a context where both the history of migration is one of um, pathologizing and this whole construction of British history is a very whitewashed history, but also because trade unions, the, their understanding of trade union comes from mainstream media, which is their troublemakers. And so we need to correct both those stories. I'll stop here. Sorry, I've taken far too long. Thank you. No, no, that wasn't that wasn't too cool at all. That was we're so, we're so happy all of our speakers, and that was we're so happy that we yeah very happy that you joined us on this call, and thank you so much for speaking. Um, as Professor Anita said, a book striking women struggles and strategies of South Asian women workers from Grunwick to Gay Gourmet is available. As is the website that you just saw. Take a look. There's some really 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 great resources on that website. And now we will be moving on to our second speaker, which is Farida Stanikzai, someone who has a great deal of local and first-hand experience of dealing with migrant issues in her role as operations manager at Barnet Refugee Service. Farida joined us on our launch event, and we're very, very happy to have her back with us. So now it is over to you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about uh, refugees and asylum seekers. But today, I think I will mainly focus on asylum seekers. That uh, many of you may know that when um, asylum seekers they come to the UK, then the immigration officer, for example, from different ports of entry, Dover or Heathrow, they provide them. A, they accommodate them in uh, initial accommodations, which is called also emergency accommodation. And there are two big accommodations called Barry House and Bridgestock House that uh, they uh, they used to uh, share um, four or five people, one room. But since COVID started, obviously they cannot do this. This is why uh, the home office made contract with a variety of uh, different hotels uh, across London bed and breakfast, holiday in hotel, stay club, Crown Prosa hotels to accommodate um, uh, asylum seekers. Those uh, that they moved from those shared accommodation from Barry House and Bridgestock House, but also when the new arrivals come. And um, I mainly focus now with the Barnet, that at Barnet there are three hotels, but today I heard there is another hotel as well, that one is in Colindale, one in the Brink Cross, uh, the holiday Inn, there is another one in Hendonway, and I heard the new one which is in Finchley, that they, we have around kind of 760, 770 people, including children in these hotels, and uh, around 130 of them are children, the rest are uh, adults, and um, our clients, uh, to be honest, they are not, many of them, they are not complaining about the hotels, they are really nice and clean. But the main thing is that we, they are struggling. They just, the home office dumped them to this um, accommodation. Majority of them, they have got, uh, they have got um, um, uh, mental health problem. Uh, they, have, they don't have access to the GP. And they don't, um, I mean, um, even if they, if, if they are registered, if we help them to register with the GP, they don't uh, have proper document uh, that normally it's sent by the home office in order to get free medication and um, uh, I mean hot food. there are lots of many people they complain about the food because there's a company that provide them 
very spicy food and for some people that they are not used to uh, eating spicy food or because of their health problem they cannot eat the, uh, these sorts of food this is the big issue and majority of them because when they come especially especially through the channel they they don't have uh, clothes and they only come with a kind of shorts or uh, flip flops and um, uh, they they when you when i go i to be honest i go every day to different hotels with our volunteers and one of our volunteers here hajar we go and we see that majority of them they are in need of clothes that they don't have clothes and they are entitled some hotels they provide them five pound uh, voucher five pound a day voucher ask them that they can buy three meals more i mean but some hotels they do not provide them voucher they just they have got a kind of they, because they don't have kitchen they only provide them um, kind of hot food uh, food and the morning kind of cereal and then in the afternoon and i mean lunch and dinner same sort of food every day repetitively same thing like rice and um, kind of chicken and the hygiene the quality of food is not good at all and clear spring which is a property dealer the private company home office made a contract with clear spring that clear spring is responsible to provide accommodation and food and financial support but luckily these days we we try our best and we i myself with uh, with one of my colleagues we managed to involve barnet council uh, to support us in terms of how we need to have a kind of proper strategic plan how we can support these people because some of them they have got mental health issue and i'm, I'm i don't know if you know that we lost one of our asylum seekers few, a few weeks ago in one of the hotels because she was complaining about back pain but uh, her, his complaint wasn't taken very serious and then uh, we, we found his body dead in his room and we don't obviously we don't want these things to happen again and again we do have pregnant women we do have people epileptic diabetic and the other thing is some of them they come with uh, open wound with um, uh, i mean um, um, uh, lots of kind of uh, uh, sorry infection in their teeth and um, i keep i'm mean, crying for support because obviously i don't say that they are not helping they might help us but it takes time and for the time being you know we are the only organization in the borough of bonnet we are already overwhelmed with lots of kind of you know because of covid 19 our job is not double triple but this is again at the top of what we do in the borough to support asylum seekers and refugees they don't have warm clothes. Children, uh, you know, to be honest, two, three days ago, I went to one of these hotels and I looked at the children and I, I, and I, I had tears in my ear. I mean, tears in my eyes that some of them, they were crying for a small kind of you know, toys. The parents keep telling me they, 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 they are at the hotel, they don't do anything. Some of them, I mean, the um, uh, older one, you are in the process to register them with the school. And to be honest, sometimes Clear Spring also helped them to register them with the school. But some of them, you know, they are they don't have proper clothes and they 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 don't have ties to play all day. They are locked in their rooms and they obviously they don't have TV. Lots of problem, lots of things are happening. And hopefully now with the support of different charities, different I mean Young Barnet Foundation and other places, and with the support of Care for Calais and Barnet Refugee Service. We try now, we, I just had a meeting today, how we can, you know, boost them up with maybe with some sort of Christmas gift for children and maybe some kind of voucher for the adult to go and get some support. Uh, Hajar is, I think she's present at this meeting now, that uh, we had a family that the children were crying for milk and bread. And then we, we were in the hotel around 8 o'clock. And then what happened, um, um, uh, Hajar, who is one of the who's so passionate to help these people we finished our visit because i took some toiletry and a bag of rice for um, families uh, and then on the way back uh, she went to buy uh, milk and bread and she went back to the hotel to provide for that child because we can't see that in this country a child is crying for a cup of milk and um, a piece of bread but these are the reality that we face every day with our client group 
we do we did have one client that actually uh, when he fall off the lorry i think he broke his finger and uh, they in french in france they put a kind of mental in his thumb but two months he couldn't have access to hospital and even the town was smelling you know and then again we um, um, we took him to Barnet hospital and our colleague was there until one o'clock in the morning and then the next day they, he was referred to uh, royal free hospital but now we are happy that at least you know we managed to help him to to now he's feeling much better compared to few a uh, few days ago these are all the challenging we are facing in them i mean as a whole in Barnet. I don't want to take too much time. Sorry, is that? Uh, thank, thank you very much, Farida. And that's uh, that's true. It's just harrowing, isn't it? Like this isn't you know this isn't that far away. This is all stuff that's happening like 10, 20 minutes from where we all live. You know, this isn't far away. This is in Barnet right now. And yeah, thank you so much for the work you do, Farida. And thank you so much for joining us to to speak more. Uh, and now. On to our next speaker, uh, we are joined and very happy to have Susan Quaver with us. Susan has worked for 15 years as a National Development Officer uh, with Unison, um, Strategic Organising Unit, sorry, a bit of a mouthful. Unison Strategic Organising Unit uh, with lead responsibility in organising migrant workers. In the Philippines, Susan has worked as Chief Executive Director of the International Transport Workers Federation and part of the campaign against flag of convenience um these are all so yeah we're very happy to have susan with us and if i would just pass over to her now hi good evening thank you very much for inviting me tonight here in barnet transformed uh currently i'm actually a, a community activist a volunteer and um, organizer in the filipino communities uh, in the UK, in, in based mainly in London. And uh, what I really want to share with you is about what we are doing in terms of organizing undocumented uh, people in the UK who has been really badly affected, uh, not only by COVID, but of course the continuing hostile environment that the UK government has unleashed in, into the, to the country, which has really have been um, um giving a very devastating um effect on many people who especially those who are in a kind of shadows and are not really seen by many people or don't don't, don't even get counted uh into the in in any kind of uk um um services and 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 conditions that we have now um, I mean, just a little bit of background about the Filipino community. You know, we have been in the UK as coming mostly, probably as you know, as nurses and carers in, in the public uh, sec service sectors. Uh, that was part of my work when I was in, in Unison. I was organizing many of the migrant care workers and health workers in the public service sector workers union. But also we have a lot of domestic workers coming into the UK which um, I'm sure also you would have probably have heard because there was a time when, you know, this is long back, way back now, 20 years ago, I think probably, when the Oxford Dictionary defined Filipinos as domestic workers. So we had to really campaign against that and uh, we fought very hard against it. And now they, they've realized that, you know, it's a wrong definition of Filipinos. But anyway, that's one of those kind of har harrowing um, um experience of discrimination in our community but many of our many although although many of us are working in public sector sector workers uh, many of us are also working within the shadows of the many of the work that uh our, you know now as cleaners as domestic workers as nannies as um um you know carers also in the private care homes and over a period of time uh we've campaigned against uh the irregular and undocumentation of many workers because of the way in which the government changed the rules around immigration. Uh, many people come here on a regular visa, but then over a period of time, the government at its whim will change the rules of the, of the immigration uh, system, which makes many of these people undocumented. Over a period of time, we've campaigned and organized 
many domestic workers and there's a point in time where we want the regularization of many domestic workers under the labor government but then of course it was reversed by the conservative party government it was also a period in time when many of the care workers coming to the uk not only filipinos but other nationalities like from china from india from sri lanka coming as care workers to the uk have also been made irregular by the change in the government policy and and they're starting to reject the the um, uh, extension of their visa of many of these care workers migrant care workers come to the uk and as care workers as you know they're very low paid and very uh, in the very difficult situation of work but over the period of the campaign that we did we've managed to unite many care workers migrant care workers and supported by uh different mps in order to force the government to give concession so that over a period of two years of campaigning for the regularization of many migrant care workers, we again won a concession on this, of course, under the Labour Party government. But nevertheless, it was a difficult situation. Many people have lost everything and they went into debt and some of them even um, uh, went, had a lot of mental health problems. Now, during COVID and at this point in time, the problem of re precarity again around the issue of migration and and um, undocumentation not only of migrant workers but also many of our asylum seekers and refugees as our colleague from uh, Farida has said in terms of the the situations that they're facing in the the covid has really unleashed even the worst kind of face of this hostile environment i know that during the period of covid and the pandemic many people who are undocumented from our community died and and some of the people that we know who have who struggled and and uh, lost a lot of things in their life in, in the process uh, because of covid and the, the lack of, of ability to access health services even though they were they were ill of covid and they're in danger of spreading the the disease they had to work but they also uh, were, were frontline workers many of them are care workers also working in specific uh, private homes of of people but also as as, as cleaners as uh, shopkeepers and so on so there were you know we, we have people who died because they contracted covid or because of destitution and and poverty because of losing their jobs and losing their homes uh, becoming homeless but in the process the whole kind of pandemic also have shown to us that solidarity comes up from that there was an upsurge of solidarity among the, the people in our community not only among filipinos but but we with also other southeast and east asian communities that we know and now we're also linking with other communities from different countries who are in the kind of same situation as many of our undocumented people in our community in, in the filipino community but part part of the the whole thing is really our ability to to get people together and to get them to do some actions and uh, uncommon um, uh, organizing uh, work, which although is very difficult now, especially because of COVID and we couldn't even see each other or meet each other. I mean, over the period of uh, six to eight months, I've been we've been doing this work. I have worked with many people only only meeting them through Zoom. And we kind of build trust and build organizations and build communities via Zoom, which everybody is doing here now, which is actually amazing, but also uh, devastating to a degree because we know that there's uh, the difference with Zoom and and human um, um, touch and and uh, action together is quite different. But nevertheless, during the period, we managed to hold our protest action in relation to the irregular and uh, irregularity of many of the people that we started to build communities with. Um, we've written to uh, MPs, we've set up early day motion in parliament in order to uh, demand for regularization of migrant workers. We've set, we set up a, a network of more than 100 uh, organizations now under the umbrella of the Status Now for All campaign. And uh, we all, we have also um, met with the mayor of London on separate occasion in order to push the mayor of London to to make a position on 
uh, in show, in, on regularization of undocumented people, even in London. But of course, you know, the mayor being a mayor is, is, is very astute in his response because he, he always say that, you know, he has no problem with um, supporting undocumented people, but the, the law is not uh, the, a law that uh, his party has put forward. So, but at any rate, we keep on pushing because uh, our, the people who are undocumented themselves are now able, and many of them are now able to speak about their situation in front of MPs. We've uh, organized several meetings with MPs, my, member of parliament who are supportive. We have the early day motion, as I said, and we also are now in the process of meeting with some lords in the House of Parliament in order to push for our campaign for regularization. Um, many of these are being done by people who are undocumented themselves or people who have lived experience of going through precarious uh, immigration situations in the UK and are still in a kind of precarious situation, even though they have temporary leave to remain. So we work also quite a lot with trade unions, as you know, because I myself is a trade unionist. And there are some issues within the trade unions, I know, in relation to undocumented workers, because in the trade unions, it has been quite difficult for them to be able to support and represent many of the undocumented workers in the workplaces because of immigration status. And this is one of the area which many, which, which we want to, to bring forward to many trade unions across the country that um, undocumented migrants also have employment rights and human rights. And if they're violated in terms of their, their right to their employment, like the right to be paid and the, the right to be treated with respect and dignity, I think that trade unions should support these workers. As organizations, community organizations, we have been forced to do that on behalf of the work of the undocumented migrants demanding for pay for wages which has not been paid and and taking people to 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 task when they have abused and exploited many of the workers undocumented workers that we work with so at the moment we are in a kind of a zoom building communities exercise with undocumented workers to a degree it gave them courage many undocumented people gave, gave them courage because they can speak in in zoom and without the fear of being reported to home office or being deported or you know um, caught by immig immigration uh, police but i think the most important thing is that uh, the solidarity that had come out from the experience of um, covid and then the oppression that many people have experienced throughout the period and how not been and now had been exacerbated by the situation that we are now make made these people really strong and organized and determined to ensure that their situation will change you know there's only so much we can do in order to push people to the wall and once they're pushed they will try to push back and i think many of us now are pushing back even more stronger than you know it was before because of the, the, the livelihood, the right to live and the right to life and the right to be treated with respect and dignity in this country, even as undocumented migrants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for that. Just very, very happy with all the speakers we've had so far. I feel like we're covering a lot of, a lot of different perspectives and I feel that it's just it's you can't you can't forget quite how much the last what when was March third so the last nine months have really shone a spotlight on the dire working conditions the lack of dignity all of the things that have been mentioned so far I think it's really good to get all of these different viewpoints from you know, academics to trade unionists organisers all it's great and but before we move on I just want to remind you that we'll have a ten minute session after all the speakers have spoken um you can ask a question and hopefully one of the speakers will be able to answer it this means we can only take a few but please feel free to start posting short questions in the chat um if you don't feel comfortable typing then please put a plus in the chat and we might have time to take questions from the floor otherwise we'll pick a few from the chat to put to our speakers so yeah 10 minutes at the end if you've got a question you want to ask anyone uh start thinking now um, our final speaker is a friend 
of Barnet Transform also joined us on our launch event. Very happy to have their support. And um, yeah, so over to Maymuna Osman, an activist and organizer working with migrants organized who will be telling us about Firm Charter. Thank you, Max. Um, and yeah, I just want to start by um, extending my thanks to organizers of Barnet Transform for putting together this excellent program of three sessions um, in what has been a very challenging year. So thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Maymuna. I work for an organization called Migrants Organize. We're based in West London. Um, and we work with our members who experience a sharp end of hostile environment policies every day um, to organize against uh, this system of oppression, which infiltrates um, public institutions um, and attempts to make um, ordinary workers into um, border guards. So we do that, so we organize, but we also um, provide direct um, support and practical support for individuals, um, legal support, um, benefits, housing advice, um, and just a space for people to participate in activities. Um, we realize that people cannot organize um, unless they can physically survive. Um, so yeah, that's what we do at Migrants Organize. Uh, we org organize around people's problems and issues, things that are affecting them in the now. Um, but we also have an unapologetically ambitious um, vision for the future. And that's where the firm charter comes in. And that's what I'm hoping to talk briefly about today. Um, and, I, and I hope to keep it brief so that we can have time to discuss with you all, um, because that's uh, the important part of today. Um, but yeah, the Fair Immigration Reform Movement Charter um, is a tool for us to realise this vision. Um, and I hope that it will be a, a useful resource for you in Barnet and also elsewhere. Um, but first, why is the charter necessary? Um, as all the other speakers have highlighted, our communities are facing a growing crisis. Um, there's a powerful and repressive system which connects Grenfell Fire to Windrush, um, to hostile environment, to the disproportionate number of BAME and migrant people that are dying from COVID-19. Um, that as well as the repression of Black Lives Matters protesters that we saw over the summer and the vilifying of asylum seekers arriving on our shores in, in dinghies. Um, so state racism in Britain is really on the, right, at, on the rise as well as the far right across um, the globe. Um, and it's really bearing directly on our people um, in our communities and on our streets. So um, as co comrades and colleagues have outlined um, already, um, history has shown us that we, we really can win and we can win when we come together, um, despite the difficult conditions. If we come together in powerful coalitions, um, such as the Status Now Network, which Susan talked about and Migrants Organise is a proud member of, um, we, can, we can start growing our power and building our power for, for migrant justice. And that, that is what the Charter is about. Um, is starting to build a movement for migrant justice, uh, one that is connected and brings together various different campaigns which are, which are happening locally and um, across the UK. Um, so I'm hoping that I can show you some slides later on which will illustrate some of the demands in, in the Charter. But I think what is really important and what I hope that we get out of this session today um, is that the hostile environment is not new uh, and Britain's immigration policies are connected to this history of colonialism and imperialism um, which continues to underpin Britain's relationships with migrant communities today um, and a lot of the history has been made invisible um, so I think that's why today is so important it's giving us the tools to kind of challenge um, existing narratives, um, uh, like Professor um, Sundari said, to reclaim our histories. Like all of this is so, so important uh, for us as activists and organizers. Um, I've learned a great deal today from, from strategies that we were used. And um, at Migrants Organized, we've also looked to other campaigns from the past um, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, there were campaigning groups called, uh, who were campaigning against the no pass laws, so NHS, um, charging and internal borders in the NHS um, and academics like Catherine Median have done amazing research to like, highlight um, these forgotten campaigns and, and histories so what, we had no idea honestly we had no, we had no idea about um, these campaigns and so that helped us to inform strategies around 
um, patients, not passport campaigns that we're that we're um, pursuing today. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that we learn from our struggles of the past um, and we incorporate those learnings into our strategies of today. And I hope that um, the firm charter can be used as a tool for us to start um, beginning those discussions. Um, so going on to the to the charter, um, what it really is is um, more than just a, a document. It, it's meant to be a practical tool that we can start. Um, bringing people together around a shared set of principles, a way for us to discuss um, how, how we really build a connected and, and organized movement for, for migrant justice. Um, and so we, um, we started this process um, two years ago, um, maybe a bit longer, and started having these discussions with our members who are experiencing hostile environment, with other organizations, um, and this is what we came up with, basically. Um, and if I have time, I will share some slides, if that's okay. Okay. Um, are you able to see that? Okay, great. Um, so this was the process of um, building the charter. Um, the conversations that we had, so this is um, conversations um, in Manchester with some of our members. Um, again, more conversations with members. This was actually at um, a TWT event, so with a conversation with some attendees there. Um, and what, what that process really highlighted was that there was just a desperate need for a migrant-led movement for justice and one that was connected and, and organised. Um, and uh, people came up with demands which were relevant to their campaigns, so campaign, campaigns on deportation, other, other campaigns. Um, and I will share the link, hopefully, to the Charter, if it hasn't been shared already, so that you can have a read of it in your own time. Um, but essentially, the main demands um, that everybody um, agreed on were dignity, so ending the hostile environment, justice, um, recentering justice in our society, welcome um, fighting the hate which was rising um, in, in, in society and action, um, so doing it together um, because there were a lot of amazing campaigns but um, a need for it to be joined up and connected. So yeah, those were um, the demands and there were, you can, you can have time to read it, but there's specific demands around immediate end of deportations, de detention, NHS charging, demands for historical justice, um, including apologies, reparations, and other means of restitution for historical crimes of exploitation and colonial violence, um, and just much, much more. Um, but like I said earlier, it's not meant to be this kind of pie in the sky document. It's, it's really um, a practical tool for us to use to build power um, and a way of conceptualizing ourselves um, as part of a, a strong movement. Um, so we had um, our first set of um, actions, um, and so people rallied around the, the charter in October, actually, um, and it was a weekend of action um, against a hostile environment, um, and people, over a thousand people took action um, using um, demands from the charter, linking it into local campaigns um, under the banner of Solidarity Knows No Borders. Um, and so I'm just going to share some of the images from, from the actions here um, in October in the hope that it kind of gives you, um, it gives you a sense of um, the strength of, that we have when we're connected and when we're joined up and also hope that um, there's many of us out there um, and in these bleak and dark times that, you know, we can organise and we can win. Um, so, yeah, these are some of the pictures. So yeah, thank you. I hope I hope that was short and concise. And um, if you would like to get involved, um, please do um, sign the charter, and then you can get updates. Um, we have organising meetings. Um, we just had our last one last week, and we hope to pick them up in in January. So yeah, get involved. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you there soon. And um, thanks so much again for our speakers and what an incredible note to end on. I'm sure we'll all want to get involved with the firm charter and the
incredible work of Migrants Organised, um, as I've seen. So, so far we've had one question, um, which we'll um, put to the speakers now, um, and I think it's probably aimed most at Anita, but I will um, let all speakers. Um, and that is, can the speakers briefly talk about the work of different communities' workers' associations? So like in the Grunwick strike, uh, South Asian groups like the Indian Workers' Association, etc. Um, so do any of our speakers have particular thoughts on that? So yes, um, <clears throat> the Indian Workers' Association was active during the Grunwick strike. And it's less so now. I think what's happened in this country over a period of time, and particularly since the 70s, I'd say, is that there's been a separation of different kinds of movements. And so, for example, we had a separation of women's movement from um, worker issues around workers' rights. Some of it is also um, as part of the professionalization of services. And so what we see less of, so there's been a decline in community-based movements which look at the whole worker and in a way that replicates the problem um, that workers face. So when they work for an employer, the employer is only interested in their labor, but they're humans. What you get when you employ, when you hire someone's labor is you get a human being who has a whole range of other issues and whole different aspects of their life. So they may be engaging with difficulties on, uh, in relation to their uh, you know, sponsorship of their spouse, so they may be engaging with issues to do with health, um, um, you know, welfare or um, domestic violence. And so we had a little bit of a separation of different uh, movements in relation to those areas. But there's also in the recent past, there's also been trade unions are increasingly looking at community organizing, for example, or there are groups like the Living Wage, uh, the Campaign for Citizens UK Living Wage, which are trying to organize at the community level. So I think uh, if we have to think about the way forward, I think we need to, movements need to look at the whole person and um, not see workers' rights as separate from other aspects, other fights, other struggles that workers are facing. So recently I did some, I was doing some work with, work with migrant workers and they were talking about how their employer used to, they used to have access to overtime. They could have put their names down for overtime. But now the overtime was only awarded to people who were good workers and these workers um, needed that overtime in order to meet the salary threshold that would enable them to bring their spouse over. And the employers knew that and this is how they control the workers. And the trade union asked me to come in and talk to them about Grunwick and the trade union was saying, I can't see why they can't uh, take strike action. And, and because the trade union couldn't see that it was the whole worker and there, there were other issues that were constraining them, they, they couldn't quite understand the decisions that the workers were making and why it was difficult for them to organize. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but some thoughts on how we might organize better and organize more effectively. Thank you so much. Um, do any of our other speakers have thoughts on that topic? Um, if not, we'll move to the next question. No, no others? Okay, fab. Um, so um, the next question I have is um, just about where we can find the um, details for the um, clothes and toys drive um, for the Barnet Refugee Group. So um, if we can um, get some information on that from Farida, that would be fantastic. Can you repeat again, sorry? Um, they just wanted information on how to, uh, where to send the toys and clothes. Um. Um, what I did, I sent my email address and my telephone number on the chat box. If anyone is interested, um, uh, uh, with, during Christmas, we prefer to give new clothes, not second hand. And, um, also, mainly they need um, underwear and socks because, you know, we can't give them second-hand one. And toys, um, I already mentioned my telephone number, which is 07828527519. And I also mentioned my email address, which is Farida, F-A-R-I-D-A, at 
p hyphen r hyphen s dot o r g dot u k that we are planning to do 22nd and 21st and 22nd 21st is monday i prefer if anyone wants to help because we are organizing everything on friday which will be i don't know 18 or 19. Uh, it would be great if anyone wants to help then can do it before 19th of december really appreciate it. thank you